Hello, every folks, and welcome to something of a beginner's guide uh, to Tactics Ogre Reborn here. Uh, so just kind of something to bear in mind is that uh, while there's many things going on with this game, especially when it comes to this particular remake, um, it has... It's been essentially made in such a way that you really can't necessarily make bad decisions when it comes to your character builds here. But what I wanted to do is kind of go over kind of the ins and outs of what's actually important, what isn't, and uh, all the kinds of things that you can be paying attention for. So, with no further ado, let's uh, go ahead and get going. So, first thing that you need to know, we should probably cover what these stats even do. So, there's basically a lot of things that are going to be determining your character. I mean... The, the names are pretty obvious given the classes we'll go over in a bit. The elements essentially will uh, counter each other in different ways. And I actually love that this more or less uh, more or less follows a fairly logical pattern. So uh, essentially uh, air will beat earth, earth will beat lightning, lightning will beat water, water beats fire, fire beats ice, uh, ice beats air, and then light and dark will both uh, will essentially both uh, counter each other. Now, what's interesting on this, by the way, uh, just one little niche mechanic that uh, doesn't really come up very often, so I figured I'll go ahead and start off with it here. Actually, the more that you use a particular element, uh, the actual tendency of the map uh, tends to favor that particular element. So if, for example, you wanted to have a little bit of fun and, uh, you know, build your whole team towards a particular element, that's uh, that's totally a thing. I mean, it would open you up to some weaknesses for sure, um, but uh, it, it's kind of a fun thing to essentially throw down a bunch of thunderstorms and then suddenly realize, oh, you know, all of my lightning damage is improving little by little over time. Uh, this is a element called Prevailing Element uh, that uh, is kind of like causing a little map-wide fight between different elements in the background. This is a super niche thing that you don't really need to worry about, but I just figured I'd go throw it out there because I personally find it really, really fun and interesting. So, anyway. Let's move on to what the rest of these stats actually do, though. So, if we go over here, uh, your movement range is going to be determined by your class. This is uh, then further modified by your skills. So, for example, a skill like Siege will remove one movement, but let you ignore uh, Rampart Auras. Uh, whereas upgrading most of the uh, leg items in the game will improve your movement by one or two. Uh, your jump is improved by uh, upgrading your uh, uh, your arm slot, um, but uh, generally speaking, it's going to be around the uh, roughly three to four range. Definitely, always upgrade your arm slot items. Uh, the extra movement doesn't sound like much, but there's a lot of uh, th openings that it suddenly gives you. Um, your movement type is really more of a general guideline, but mostly what you need to know here is that. Uh, well, most of your characters will have uh, have different versions for this. Uh, what most of them will be agile, and very few of them are slow. But uh, there's a lot more nuance to it than that. See, when a character moves, essentially they are paying a certain cost for every tile that they move. Um, now, it doesn't really detail this number anywhere. Like, for example, uh, Canopus as a buccaneer um, is uh, is uh, keeping his uh, flying type, but technically, if he were to switch back over to his standard Barton class. He would have higher movement, but he would be paying a higher movement cost per tile that he moves as that unit. But generally speaking, what you kind of need to bear in mind is just uh, just the yet yeah, the, the lower you the less that you move, the faster your next turn comes. Everything that you do is essentially calculated. So you see over here where it says RT plus 28 for that weapon. Like uh, dual wielding weapons sounds pretty good, but then you also have to realize you're also paying double the movement cost uh, for using that particular weapon twice. But anyway, a uh, general rule of thumb is that yeah, everything that you do is going to be uh, is going to come with a cost. So every skill that you use comes with a cost. Uh, every uh, finisher they use comes with a cost. Every item comes with a cost. So, uh, for example, a Mending Essence uh, is a full heal, but it's going to be taking you a decent bit longer to use than, for example, a Mending Salve. So if you can get away with healing less, that gives you a potentially uh, useful thing to do there. So, for example, if instead I wanted this plume, like let's say a Mend Leaf plus one is only RT12, and the full heal uh, essentially takes about four times as much. Uh, so. Typically, uh, typically, the less something is upgraded, the better uh, value you're going to get out of it. Like, for example, Mending Seeds are only RT plus 15, so that's pretty good right there. Um, any dang ways, uh, let's go ahead and uh, go back here real quick. So, by and large, is as you upgrade a weapon, uh, you are going to be seeing an increase in the, uh, in the weight of the thing, but you're also going to be seeing a, uh, a, an increase in its attack value. So... When it comes to attack value, you know that this isn't like a, a base attack score, so to speak. Uh, it, it essentially isn't going to be the only thing that matters. 
See, the uh, the damage formula in this game, while we are waiting on, you know, on the modders to clarify how much of the original system remains, it worked a little bit like this, that uh, in the first phase of the attack calculation, you are essentially taking your offensive stats, so that is going to be your strength and dexterity, and uh, those are then checked against the opponent's strength and vitality, or... Uh, at that point, it was uh, resistance and vitality. Now, in this case, I believe it's resistance and mind that might be checked instead. Or it might just be resistance. I'm not sure. Magic is very consistent, and also uh, magic is not resisted by vitality anymore. I know that much. But, um, or at least it is to a very diminished capacity. Alright, so here's kind of how it goes with weapons in this game, because uh, even if you're coming from the PSP version, stuff does actually work a little bit differently this time around, in that uh, even stuff that seems like a straight upgrade may not necessarily be the case. So like, for example, something like uh, the Zwei plus one here uh, is, uh, is previously something that would have been a pretty big boost when you get it, but maybe not as useful later. But essentially what we're seeing here is that this thing is going to be 5% better uh, whenever fighting undead stuff. Um, its attack value isn't necessarily higher. Um, so basically, attack value is something that comes in at the final end of the calculation. So it starts off with stats essentially being compared against each other. So, you know, the offensive stats go versus the uh, defensive stats, at which point all scaling is applied um, in the sort of second phase. So, like, for example, this thing gets six bonus, uh, uh, that's of a crushing type, and then five bonus if it's, a, uh, if it's going against an undead. Meanwhile, on the armor side, it would look at that and say, like, oh, you know, I'm wearing a brigandine, so 4% of that uh, crush bonus is mitigated, um, and then it would have uh, these other bonuses here as well. Now, back in the PSP version, basically this would have added up to just uh, just nine physical defense bonus. I'm not exactly sure if this is still going to be the same way, where they weren't necessarily exclusive in all situations, but we'll assume that in this case it's taking away 4% of that crush damage, and that particular armor isn't taking away any of that, uh, isn't really uh, taking away anything beyond that. But then we go look at the helmet, and it's con taking that into consideration as well, so another 6% is getting reduced there. Uh, we have uh, the gloves not really reducing any of it. Uh, we have another 3% being reduced by the leggings, and another 1% being reduced by the ring. So essentially, this thing's bonuses... Uh, as it is right here, would be entirely mitigated. Um, so it would not be getting any bonuses, um, un except for that undead bonus. So, okay, fine, fair enough. But then on the final end, uh, on the final step of the calculation, it compares the attack value versus the defense value, and that's really where this comes in. So essentially, like, let's say whatever number you happen to get off of that first calculation, if it didn't get scaled up anywhere, then the attack value is added to it, and then it goes against the opponent's defense. Now, why am I explaining all this? Because there's no way in hell anyone's going to understand this on the fly. Well, I just want you to understand the general idea that attack value is not necessarily the biggest thing in this version of the game. Essentially, it slightly will increase your final number, and it may potentially uh, help in terms of uh, kind of getting it past uh, the opponent's armor, but just know that if you have a character with high enough stats, they basically can get away with using a uh, using a lighter and potentially trickier weapon with to better effect than, for example, a you know a higher attack value weapon. Just so you're aware. So, for example, if he were to go and go for the uh, the Zweihander right here, uh, he would potentially have a breach uh, a breach on hit. Um, but like if we're comparing this with the far later game Damascus Blade here, he is getting he is essentially paying seven less recovery time per swing. Uh, he has uh, two less weight uh, for carrying the thing around, and potentially that uh, three strength and uh, two vitality would be a decent uh, bit more valuable to him than just two vitality and two avoidance. So like for example, the stat bonus on on this is better. Or for example, going for something like the Bastard Sword here, the uh, two dex and three strength might potentially overall end up giving him more overall damage, potentially, than uh, than the extra attack value off the sword right here. Now, bear in mind, again, we don't know exactly how all this works, but generally speaking, a good move, like, essentially just taking a good move with a good bonus, um, with good speed, is oftentimes going to be more valuable than, you know, something a little bit later. Like, for example, right here, the main reason I'm using this Damascus over here uh, is just due to the fact that it has a stun effect on there. So it's perfectly viable to pick a weapon strictly for the type of bonus that it gives you. So like, for example, the Claymore plus one has a breach effect, which will increase the maximum damage versus that unit by 20%. 
the uh, this Wayhander plus one has this as well, but the Damascus can stun. Because if you've ever seen a uh, Damascus weapon, then things are actually pretty stunning. I love that they kept that little joke in here, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, point being, all weapon categories will have some little version of this. And generally speaking, it's advisable to kind of carry around different types of uh, different types of weapons because, if nothing else, they may potentially be turned into you know something different down the road. So, like for example, I'm pretty sure it was the cutlass here that's able to then be upgraded into the Walloon sword. Um, but anyway, point being that yes, it, attack value is not everything. Oftentimes, the uh, the stats and uh, bonuses in this one will end up mattering more. Um, so. Like for example, right here, the uh, the cutlass with its false strike is actually pretty handy. If they're if they're having an issue with units hitting them, combining this false strike, which is a little bit difficult outside of item debuffs to land on somebody else, essentially lowers their physical accuracy. So this could be very handy in situations where, for example, you don't want them getting countered. Uh, so for example, you use a, a dodge item on a unit with the uh, with the cutlass plus one here, and suddenly that is 40% a better potential evasion uh, versus a counter attack. That could be potentially what you're looking for, or maybe you just want to go about it a completely different way. Maybe you go for something like a warrior, and instead you decide to, let's say, put on something like Tremendous or, or, or a Mighty Impact. You just smack the person one tile away, preventing the counterattack from coming whatsoever. Essentially, there's a lot of different ways to accomplish anything that you might potentially want to accomplish in this game, so there really is no one-size-fits-all solution. It, it Really, it's been this way since the PSP version, but the version that we got in the, in the US um, basically came with a much bigger emphasis on armor mechanics. That's why I'm mentioning this, uh, this attack value thing, by the way. Um, so, just, uh, just for folks that, uh, that wanted to know. Alright, so... What, the way that you should look at every one of your units is effectively as a toolbox. So, we're not talking only about the items that they carry, you know, if you have certain debuffs that you see that you're running into issues with, then maybe potentially carry some of those around. So, for example, you know, Leaden and Hobble don't come up very often, but if somebody combines a Leaden and a Slow, that unit won't be doing anything for a very long time. You can essentially combine two different effects that can slow a unit down, and they would be stuck for a while. Uh, that's, again, one of those weirdly specific situations where you can just combine things to more or less prevent a unit from acting, rather than outright kill them. If they have a lot of defense, like for example, if we go back here and we take a look at this like knight right here, okay? It's like a knight is your standard human defensive unit. Uh, their whole deal is uh, that they are going to be, uh, uh, they're usually going to be running something like Phalanx, which reduces all income that they, all incoming damage by 80%. Um, and then usually they will have uh, something like Rampart Aura, uh, which will prevent them from, uh, which will prevent units from circling around them. It gives them a zone of control, so to speak. Additionally, they have something like Sanctuary uh, that can be put on there that prevent undead from getting close to them. Now, whether or not you use different amounts of these at different times is entirely up to you. These are just all potential options for you to consider. Like, personally, the reason that I went for this guy is because he is built to be a recruiter. I did have a more offensive variant of a knight. Uh, she was uh, slightly murdered recently by a, uh, by a lizard, and anyway, we'll just go ahead and not go on further about that story. Anyway, um, so like for example in his case, uh, he, you know, he already came as ice, so giving him an ice sword seemed like a pretty obvious choice, you know, give him a little bit bonus damage because he's essentially the same type element, um, but has a nice little parry 3 on there. You really don't have to worry about these kinds of things in the early game. But I gave him a crossbow because already defensively, he's pretty good. He's got a lot of vitality, which means he can take physical hits very well. Um, he's essentially been... Uh, well, he's had different armors uh, at different times, but any time that there was an option to upgrade his resistance, I ended up going for it, because that is his main uh, his main issue. Um, but realistically speaking, you know, something like this, just building for defense, uh, t stacking up uh, particular bonuses like this, it it's perfectly fine. He looks like a weird mishmash of different uh, parts here, but he's just building for resistance. His natural vitality is high enough that he doesn't really need a shield. So, like, the... The times that you would go for a shield are when you have a unit who feels like they're constantly getting battered around, and you want to have somebody that can slap a unit around the around the field, so to speak. So in this particular case, I have a unit uh, that, uh, well, he's already doing just fine defensively, so I really don't want to put a shield on him. I really, uh, you know, can't be bothered with it. 
but because he's a recruiter, I want to give him a crossbow so that a light crossbow specifically, uh, so that uh, he can go and just kind of cherry tap stuff along the way. Um, so he can just go take little little taps on something at range, and then hopefully defend himself without countering at close range with a sword. Um, if he ends up uh, hitting them a bit too hard, you know, heals to make that happen, and then he goes in for the recruit. He is he is a straight recruiter type of setup. But at the same time, like let's say I wanted to build somebody defensive, then I've got uh, or somebody extremely defensive who's just built a wall. So then we've got uh, Mr. Evan over here. So in his case, he was given a rapier glance because his idea is that he gets in close, like he takes shots with a shield, but he uses his, uh, or he gets in close with a crossbow, but uh, once he gets in close, he uses the shield to knock units around, and because of the fact that he's very physically built, that shield is going to do a lot of damage for him. Um, additionally, uh, because uh, he's got a rapier glance over here, it's something the hoplite gets, uh, that means it gives him a chance to disable units around him at the start of his turn. Um, evade for uh, making physical attacks bounce off uh, once per uh, time that that triggers, and then apostate for uh, uh, bouncing off at least two magic effects. So he is effectively just a brick that is slowly slid forward, just kind of finding a position to be annoying, and then just taking shots along the way. Now, could this be slotted out for other things? Absolutely. Uh, putting something like Rampart Aura would be very good in this case, because it would be very difficult to dislodge, would be very difficult for enemy units to deal with. Could combine that with a pincer so that he can be in an annoying position and constantly take pincer attacks, or maybe just give him an extra 300 health off of constitution. All of these are potentially viable options, but not really something that I needed at the particular time for this team. What I'm trying to get at here is there is no, again, one-size-fits-all solution to everything. While there are a few counters, generally speaking, there's a lot of ways to deal with things. It's so like, let's scout out what's going on in this next map and see how you would normally prepare. So we see that it's snowing. So this is the ice temple. Generally speaking, when it comes to um, when it comes to different locations, uh, you will uh, you'll usually be in a position where you can kind of control what uh, what the uh, prevailing element is in an area by you know just using that element over and over and over. In this particular case, though, uh, we're looking at a case where this is a dedicated elemental temple. Uh, this means that uh, th these are locations that you'll run into later in the game. But uh, the it's basically always going to be snowing here. This is always going to be prevailing ice elements because this is literally just like a gigantic place dedicated to ice. So we're not going to be able to overwhelm that. So ice stuff will always have an advantage here. But we're looking around and what do we see? Okay, we see a Fusilier. We see a Gorgon over that direction. Uh, what's the... Uh, by the way, I love the fact that you can use uh, one half of the, of the Joy-Con and the mouse. This is... This just feels really good. <laughs> Very weird, but moving on. So we see that they're going to be a witch. Uh, they've got some uh, some hard-hitting uh, spells here. They've got a poison cloud. Uh, realistically, they're probably going to be spamming damage at range. So ideally, the way like the way that we're looking at this, we want to either outrange that, potentially maybe uh, silence them, um, or maybe you know maybe just overwhelm them with some quick units. Because we whenever you have ranged units, generally speaking, you want to overwhelm them before they can become too much of a problem. Uh, this guy is, uh, apparently he just showed, he's just the local security guard, <laughs> he's just a run to cop, he just showed up with his, uh, with his pistol. Okay, fine, whatever, we'll just ignore that guy. Um, love how it sounds like I'm completely dismissive of the damage that that guy can potentially do. Um, anyway, interesting little UI situation going on there. Um, okay. So, next up on the opposite side here, what are we dealing with here? Well, we know we're going to have a hard target from this knight. Uh, we know that we're probably going to have a hard target out of this terror knight. Typically, they are fairly bulky. So, it looks like he's running a two-hander, so he's going to be running counter on him. Fearful impact. Um, so, that means that while he does have his uh, fear debuff with him, uh, he's only going to trigger it if he takes a swing at somebody. So, if we can prevent him from swinging, the more the merrier. Uh, it doesn't look like he brought his... Um, as Lament of the Dead, so we don't have to worry about getting close. We just have to worry about uh, rushing the guy down before he can get his big hits off. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so what do we got over here? Uh, next, uh, we've probably got another Witch, or... Okay, this one's a Warrior here. Looks like uh, they've got uh, Vigorous, they've got Mighty, so we know that parries are probably not going to be very effective. Uh, something like Vigorous will counter parries, something like Mighty will knock units back. But we see that they're building for a lot of uh, pincers so far. Okay, so maybe... Uh, maybe form up a line. That sounds pretty good. It looks like a similar situation here. Again, these are just fairly basic randos. You really don't need to go with this in depth, but just in terms of the overall mindset of, like, how exactly do you counter this stuff? So, 
this is a fairly standard loadout for a lot of the casters. You get a couple damage spells. Usually you're going to have one missile, one overhead, and then a couple debuffs or utility spells. So in this case, Paralytic and Drain Mind. So Paralytic will occasionally waste a turn. Drain Mind will drain MP. So not anything super threatening there. But we know that realistically we're probably going to get bogged down on this side a little bit. But we want to rush down the left. That's more or less what we want to uh, we want to come to here. Okay. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm <laughs> showing off mouse and keyboard on this, aside from, you know, this just being fun, um, I, like, I got a pinched nerve or something in my left arm and it hurts like hell, so I'm just, like, <laughs> trying to figure out a control solution so that I can show more stuff here. Uh, anyway, so, so we want to rush down the left, so we're going to take some, uh, well, we want one unit for range, so we're going to take a Fusilier here. Actually, let's use units that are going to be available in the early game, so we're going to put a, um, an archer there to rush down, we're going to take a uh, ninja to uh, silence the caster. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get rid of you, get rid of you. We don't have any monster units, so we're not going to bother with the other one right now. We've got some heavies in front, so we're going to show a little synergy right here, um, wherein uh, we have Denim running a, uh, a poison spear, um, and we have Vigorous on this unit uh, with a poison claw, meaning that both of these can potentially have a guaranteed chance of poison with a melee attack, which makes them very good can opener units, so to speak. Uh, we don't know if they're going to need some backup, uh, so we can put our Medicine Griffin over here. Bear in mind that any flying unit can potentially be very useful for this. Uh, I just call I just call this guy the Medicine Griffin here, but a uh, basic general idea is that it's just a flying unit uh, that takes advantage of our preferred element, because he's not using anything that scales to his element. Um, but like if he runs into, uh, into any water units, for example, he'll end up hurting them more. But I give him uh, two Blessing Stones, which I forgot to restock on. Probably remember to restock stuff. A buff item, in case he needs it, and then one heal, uh, one full heal for somebody. He's got a lot of health, because he's built for health, he's built for stealing health, and he's built for having really high movement and pincer. Um, along with a Ring of Vitality. So generally speaking, Vitality will help in most situations, because while magic damage is very consistent, it's usually not nearly as high as the other types of damage. Um, so, for example, Vitality is generally just a good, solid defensive option. So what I did with this guy is that, uh, yeah, he's got a lot of health, he just keeps himself annoyingly alive, and if worse comes to worse, he can run away, heal, or he can heal somebody else. But this particular unit has constantly saved the team's bacon over and over and over because of how uh, Blessing Stones work in this game. So the way that revives work is essentially uh, when a unit is revived, they are um, they're instantly granted a turn. So, for example, you'll notice that many of the units that I have will have a slot for a stone on them. This basically means that if you have one unit, they can then revive another unit, which can then revive another unit. And essentially, you can just sort of, like, chain this all up to get your entire team at once. Granted, they'll be at 10% health, but still, it gives you potentially a good way to make a comeback. You can only do this maybe one or two times per... Uh, uh, per battle that you get into, and it's very costly to use, but it is a nice little way to potentially bring yourself back from the brink, so to speak. All right, anyway, so getting back to what we are trying to do here. So on the left, um, I want a unit that's got a lot of range, so I've got my longbow archer here. I want a unit that can rush down and silence, because my plan is to rush down there, silence, uh, basically uh, get rid of their caster, and uh, and hopefully uh, deal with the other unit at the, at the same time. Because the guy is just a guy with a with a pistol, I'm not too concerned about him. But to give you an idea of what what you can p potentially uh, build here, uh, you've got this guy right here. So he's got three buffs going on with his bow. His Benum and his Envenom are exclusively going to swap out every now and then. Sometimes he stuns, sometimes he poisons. This is intentional. Um, and then he's also got a Silence on here. So the reason that we're actually uh, going to be combining him, actually, let's uh, let's swap out for the other archer. So this is actually the the preferred way to do this. So we take a little uh, little synergy right here, wherein because he's got that bow, there is a chance for him to inflict silence with it. Silence is the debuff that we want. Over here, I have what I what I like to call the skirmisher archer, uh, namely that uh, they specialize in once again having. Like having a, a, a somewhat short-range bow with a dagger. The dagger gives them a build, the ability to parry, so they can deflect anything that isn't a gun, um, and then they're able to use Engulf to increase the range of it to, to be, well, just generally better. But they've got Eagle Eye, which means that both these units will then guarantee that uh, silence effect on their bow. At the same time, they're using a dagger for its finisher availability, specifically Shadow Pin right here, which stops a unit uh, from taking their turn. Um, so essentially, if something gets too close, they can get they can get in close with the dagger, 
that can make sure that it doesn't act. Uh, this is a nice way to guarantee that a unit that's gotten past your lines is quickly dealt with, um, but at the same time, a dagger is going to do more damage than a bow in most situations. Melee damage in general is just going to be higher than bows. So, anyway, let's go ahead and kind of get into the actual fight here before I rant on for ages, and let's, uh, let's kind of explain the stuff more on the fly. The other two units, by the way, were just kind of caster support, because we're not expecting this to be a very long fight, there's not that many units involved, and we can probably overwhelm everything that's here before we end up losing anyone. So, the overall rules of every fight will end up changing, you know, obviously, there's kind of different stuff to consider. So we'll just go ahead and move him here, we'll go ahead and have him throw a rock, this guy probably will not be able to counter it. So something like a Cyclops, for example, is very good uh, when it term when it comes to shutdowns. Um, you can actually get a zombie Cyclops uh, as early as uh, any time you get into the Farampa Wildwood. Um, basically, that this will this is something that will uh, that'll come in fairly handy. Um, essentially, just being a unit that would be able to automatically revive itself if it's ever downed, but being able to be recklessly charged up ahead uh, to uh, <laughs> to deal with any kind of nonsense they may run into. Um, now let let me explain. So, like, the Cyclops over there has two abilities. Uh, it's got uh, abilities that allow it to uh, trigger a chance to stun and hobble at the start of its turn. That means that enemy units might potentially not take a turn next round, and also are one uh, are going to be losing one tile of movement. Now, this, is, this doesn't sound like much to begin with, right? It doesn't sound like anything particularly impressive. But it builds up very quickly. <laughs> like, really, really quickly. So, uh, so anyway, uh, what we're going to actually do is, uh, like I'm noticing right now, and by the way, I'm sorry, I'm still getting used to the uh, kind of mouse and keyboard controls here, um, but yeah, we're, I was thinking that maybe we might take that path at the top there, but instead we're just going to move over this direction and just kind of uh, end the turn right there. Uh, we're going to have, yeah, you're going to take your engulf and you're going to move over here, and then hopefully she ends up uh, triggering her eagle eye before they end up getting over to that side. They probably will. Um, they probably won't be within range to take too many hits by the time they get there. You're really not going to be entirely avoiding damage for the most part. But uh, anyway, okay, I'm going to switch over to the other one because it's what I'm used to. So we'll go ahead and move uh, move you over here. All right, fair enough. All right, so they're going to take a swing. They're going to take a counter. They got the poison. So really when it comes to heavy units, uh, there's a lot of ways you can deal with them. Sure, you can just uh, set up uh, pincers and multiple attacks and that kind of thing. You can send casters in to go shut them down or just kind of barrage them with damage. Um, really, my personal favorite method is to just lock them in place, prevent them from moving, and just poison them. Poison scales. So it's just a nice way to deal with most stuff. Uh, certain units will resist it, but it is a very convenient uh, way to just sort of deal with many of your problems um, as long as you're consistent with it. So, uh, for example, like many units will have multiple, or many teams will have multiple clerics. So, if they've got that, essentially that means that they would be able to, for example, get rid of two uh, two instances of poison per round. And clerics tend to be pretty fast. So, as long as you keep poisoning more units, it will continuously keep doing more damage. You can do 200 with a hit now, or you can take roughly like 50 to 100 percent uh, chance of rolls with your uh, casters to do that same amount of damage, uh, just multiple times per round. So it's more of a math game as far as that goes. Like right there, they brought counters to the poison, but we can just poison them again. <laughs> now, the way that I've set this up here, by the way, um, you generally speaking want to make sure that you're taking as few hits as possible. So if you have an opening, you usually want to try and uh, kind of keep it locked out like this, where you uh, you prevent them from circling around the back and letting any of your units get team uh, getting uh, teamed up on. Um, you want to try to prevent that as much as possible. If you're doing the rushdown strategy, then you don't really do that. But if you have areas like right here where you're dealing with a lot of heavies, you don't want to deal with uh, letting the uh, heavies get into your backfield there. Right there, we're just going to use Flaming Fists, uh, which we keep on her to uh, deal with the uh, Ice Weakness, by the way. Um, but for example, it's best to have several of your units working in teams to accomplish different goals. It's like right here, uh, he uh, he has Steel Stance, he'll be able to take any incoming hits a little bit better, but his unit behind him has slightly longer range to hopefully allow her to get in close and deal with that caster before any issues happen. Right now, we don't really want to break formation here to do anything particularly special, but ideally we want to uh, get this Purple leader, purple People Eater guy taking his turn sooner, uh, so that we would be able to uh, see him maybe throwing out some stuns or hobbles to hopefully... Uh, hopefully break down some of the defenses that we're looking at here. 
Now, unfortunately, they've uh, they've gone and they've pushed back our line slightly, but that's fine. We can just reestablish it. So, basically, if your first plan doesn't work out, obviously there's always more options to do more plans. You n you never just have one plan in mind. It's like right here. I uh, will just go ahead and uh, attempt to go for the stop, but the stop didn't work out. That's perfectly fine. Our line on the right isn't completely breached because they're still blocked off uh, by that uh, kind of uh, diagonal. Uh, once she got knocked backwards, she just got knocked to nearby a pillar. Okay, but we see that right here, our first plan is already uh, already in motion. Suddenly, the offensive potential of that unit is entirely shut down. Uh, she'll have to either uh, cure herself or something along those lines. Um, and as we see, we're taking much faster turns with our uh, guy over here, so we'll just uh, quickly throw some rocks, keep on holding that line, um, maybe get rid of some of their units, and uh, start working in a little bit closer. So, uh, we're now in a position where we're like right here, uh, we have a unit that's already poisoned, so we don't need to poison them again, we just want to do a little bit more damage. Um, she's probably going to be countering because she's got that two-hander, and we have a unit that's... Uh, that's essentially already uh, damaged, so we don't really want them to uh, uh, to potentially risk getting knocked back further. So this is one of those cases where you would just immediately probably want to go for a finisher, so finishers can't be countered, um, so uh, you just would basically go for that instead. It may cost a little bit more, um, it may not have any additional effects in some cases, but we don't really need that additional poison effect. We're, uh, we're already golden as far as that goes. Um, like right here, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different, where we're just going to essentially poke and retreat. Because if either of these units were to get knocked backwards, we essentially would lose our uh, our line here and we could get encircled, so instead we're just going to go here. Now, bear in mind, you don't really lose much um, uh, when you get encircled, but in this case we know that they've got a lot of pincers, so we just generally don't want to risk it. Now, that guy's already poisoned, but we see that we've got a high chance of poison on this guy. She just uh, triggered her concentration. So we'll go ahead and uh, throw out poison right here to just slowly deal with these two while we deal with the lighter units along the way. Now, currently we have stun available on our ninja, so this is perfectly fine. We're going to go back here, and we're going to see... Okay, we can potentially prevent him from moving later, or we can take slightly more damage with the spell, but for now it feels more appropriate to just go base stun on him. And there we go. Now he's stunned. There is a roughly 50% chance he just won't be able to act next round. It's not perfectly consistent, but again, this game is entirely about taking those little advantages and stacking them up in your favor. So, okay, well, we see that uh, they're trying to get a little bit closer here. Um, and this is a good example of what I like to uh, call the uh, the rule of six here. Basically, if there's six tiles and uh, the two tiles opposite each other are available, any ranged attack in most circumstances will be able to hit. This kind of L-shaped maneuver here, um, basically think of a knight uh, from chess, will almost always guarantee a hit. Now, the actual sight lines can vary for many of the other angles, but this one is very consistent and just kind of very easy to uh, quickly internalize here. So now we've set up a situation where just the offensive potential on those units on the left is completely mitigated, meaning that our two light units can overwhelm theirs. Now, unfortunately, they've managed to push past the line here, so hopefully they don't have any turns to push through that. But if that's the case, then you'll have to retreat and kind of reform the line, so to speak. Alright, so unfortunately that guy didn't end up missing his round. That's fine, we can still deal with it. But now that we've gotten uh, we've gotten them dealt with, we maybe want to take a few more, uh, few more actions here. So, currently she's frightened, meaning that her damage is diminished. Um, whenever you're frightened, your uh, damage and defense are diminished pretty significantly. So instead we might want to go for a debuff. So we would look for whoever would act soonest, uh, that would be this one right here. Because if they're poisoned, any time the poison ticks, it would make the charm go away. So we're going to go ahead and see if maybe their next turn will come before that. And, uh, okay, so far so good. Um, now, she is low on health, but I'm not too concerned. Uh, if she gets knocked unconscious, that's perfectly fine. We'll be able to wrap this up long before it's an issue. So we'll just go ahead and leave that situation as is. Alright, so now we want to get rid of this unit before she can do anything scary. Uh, let's see. What kind of uh, type is she? So she's lightning, so we want to I ideally... Well, ideally in this case we'd have rock. We don't have anything rock, but we can go flaming blast here. That's going to do pretty good. Um, this guy is uh, currently... Uh, well, he's a fusilier. Um, he's the only one on their side that's able to attack anything. I was going for the charm there, because there's a charm secondary effect on that move right there. Um, doesn't matter. These guys will just throw out whatever damage they can. There we go. 
Ah, that's okay. I turned on the wrong the wrong bars here. I apologize. They're uh, they're. Uh, that's why the numbers were seeming a little bit weird there. Uh, so just so you know, if you're on Switch, the uh, right uh, thumbstick will essentially trigger between these different types of bars. Uh, so yeah, that would explain why uh, they're ice type. That's why they, why they were taking better fire damage. Um, were these guys actually water? That would have. Yeah, that one's water. That's why he was taking so much more from Giga Tempest. But anyway. So ideally, like we see that uh, we can also go for the stone on her, but ideally we kind of want to deal with this guy. Um, but we're uh, we're just going to go for something like this. Yeah, if we go for that, we, uh, we potentially might have a chance to just have him attack his uh, friendly unit instead. Now, pay attention to whether or not there's a trajectory marker here. Um, if you don't see a line, that means it's just able to hit wherever you aim. Um, but if there's a line and it's showing red, that means that it does require line of sight. So something like Flaming Blast there essentially fires from the air, so it doesn't require line of sight. Whereas uh, some other ones will potentially have that limitation to them. So we see those heavier units over there are already completely pretty much melted away. We really can just go up and finish them off. Um, so we'll just go ahead and do so if we can. We can probably throw this, throw a rock at this guy. There we go. Then he won't take his turn. And we can go get a little bit of an improvement on our Cyclops over here. Uh, so these cards you don't really have to go out of your way for. Uh, just so you know, it's just a little extra bonus that you can potentially have. Um, anyway, I don't want this guy taking any of the rounds, so just in case, we're going to go ahead and take the uh, AoE Lightning here to get rid of him and damage her at the same time. Seems we've gotten a card. Uh, luck, by the way, changes by day. You really don't have to, uh, you know, go out of your way for that. Um, any dang ways... This guy's all built up for this lightning stuff. She's already lightning a burst, so she's going to be taking more from that move right there. So we'll just go ahead and wrap, wrap that particular one up at, in a bow. Not to mention, uh, he's technically a higher level than everybody else here. Um, generally speaking, uh, you'll find yourself on roughly the same level as the AI in most situations. Um, but, uh, but yeah, currently this is an area that opens up at 36. The stuff here seems to stay at about 36. And uh, I, you know, I went a little bit farther than that and wound up uh, getting to 40, but roughly between 36 and 40, there really isn't a massive difference as far as all that goes. Um, so you really shouldn't focus on levels. They may help in certain cir circumstances, but really just kind of learning to, uh, well, to position your people a little bit better um, will end up giving you far better of a result in the long run. Um, but like right there, that lady pr would have easily overwhelmed those two if she had the ability to use any of her spells, which she can't. And on the right side, while we may have lost two units, we did ultimately end up winning that fight. Um, now, no incapacitations is a completely different challenge, just so you're aware the uh, the overall playstyle is far more defensive. But for general purpose type stuff, it's perfectly fine to accept a few losses as long as you can kind of make sure that your units don't bleed out. Personally, I would recommend, like, if you end up losing units, just, you know, stick with it. You can always get more units, and it does tend to add a bit, a, a bit more drama to your story. Now, if you're potentially looking to stack up your odds versus the boss, some things that you can bear in mind with your early finishers is that uh, a lot of them will exploit uh, exploit different elemental weaknesses. Um, so, for example, if you have a... Uh, if you've got a unit that's uh, running uh, running air, uh, you can uh, have uh, uh, have some earth finishers off. Alright, got a little interrupted there, but okay. So, for your starting classes, I think it's important to just kind of bear in mind uh, the kind of how, how the class balance actually works in this game. Um, so there's a lot of different ones, like this is far from the full list or anything. Um, but, uh, but just so you know, there's all of them are really going to be serving more of their own role. While there are technically kind of sort of upgrades, really most of the classes are more of a pivot of a different description. Um, so you don't really have to worry about career paths that much. Like, if you have a unit, like, let's take, for example, this uh, shield guy I was talking about earlier. 
He was a two-hander guy uh, when he first started. He was a, a warrior with two-handers, but I figured, you know, it, it might be fun to play around with Hoplite, switched him into crossbows, and within a few fights, like, you really just have a small lag period, um, but the further a unit is behind, uh, especially in weapon skills and things like that, they'll very quickly end up catching the rest of their team. Like, he's taking a while here to, uh, uh, to max out his crossbows, like, the jump from roughly 37 to 40, it was dramatically longer than his jump from 1 to 30, for example. So it has a very nice feeling, like, whenever a unit's behind, they pick it up fairly quickly. Um, you really don't end up losing too much by having them, you know, go and do that. Like, this lady almost never uses her dagger, and she's doing just fine on actually uh, ranking this up. Um, she's been the, uh, the, the one that I've had since the very start. Meanwhile, this one right here is also the spear unit I've had from the start. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, just bear in mind that uh, both uh, magic and melee uh, uh, skills do rank up at the same time. So, for example, this guy that I've had right here is like a long-range suppression sniper. You can make some pretty dumb builds work, and they'll work just fine. Like in the PSP version, this guy would have needed to be running Augment Dark and Anatomy and Spellcraft, and he would have had to, had to boost himself before the fight. And in this particular case, like, sure, I can give him Spellcraft to make him better at certain things. I don't even know if I have any uh, leftover Spellcrafts right now. But, like... For example, like with these buffs, um, like something like Strengthen would increase your maximum physical by 20%, but something like like uh, Spellcraft would increase your uh, uh, your actual like spell. Well, again, I don't know if it's right to use the term penetration, but basically you could just say that it improves your offensive physical magic. Whereas something like spell, uh, or sorry, spell craft is the one that ends up improving your uh, uh, your magical damage, whereas spell strike would increase its accuracy. You might notice that most of the time your physical hits are hitting just fine, and your uh, your uh, uh, debuff or your uh, magical attacks are hitting just fine. But it's really the debuffs that those are there for. So to finish talking about the stats that we didn't finish talking about earlier. Generally speaking, yes. Uh, strength is both offensive and, and defensive, just your general like physical uh, physical power there. Vitality is just your ability to take a hit. Uh, dexterity is uh, for accuracy and attack value, as it says as it says there. This, uh, is, this is especially useful for a lot of trickier moves, um, and some uh, some weapons will end up scaling this slightly more. So, for example, stuff like uh, guns and katanas and uh, uh, daggers and whatnot will end up scaling slightly more with dexterity. But all weapon types will use both skills, and generally you get more value out of strength. Um, agility is just your general accuracy. Um, avoidance is going to be your ability to just, you know, roll a block uh, against everything. Um, intelligence is your uh, your raw magical power. Mind is your ability for, uh, for landing debuffs, um, as well as partially your defense. This is probably the most stacked skill in the game in terms of how much it gives you. Um, but for example, your odds of hitting, like, let's say... The, uh, the stun effect on this uh, sword over here is determined by his mind versus the other person's mind. Um, this is, at least I believe that's how this still works, because I can't help but notice that the actual odds of this uh, scorpion to hit its poison have dropped off dramatically over the, uh, over the course of the game. However, he can still combine it for a 100% uh, chance uh, using the, uh, the warrior's passive over here, so, or the warrior's uh, automatic vigorous over here, so... Either way, there's still ways to make pretty much everything work. Um, but then, yeah, and then resistance is pretty obviously just your magical resistance kind of thing. But again, these are just sort of general ideas. You don't really have to worry about it. Generally speaking, any build will be able to work right out of the box. But if you want to, for example, min-max somebody, it's so like right here, we've got Gerald and, you know, the Terranite guy. And let's say I want him to do more with his suck moves over there. He's got his MP drain. He's got his, uh, uh, he's got his uh, different... Um, uh, he's got his uh, different uh, HP and MP drains, and he's got some debuffs. If I wanted him to be better with the debuffs, I would go and try and stack him for mind, but I want him to do slightly more damage with Drain Heart, slightly more damage with Drain Mind. So, for example, while this is primarily a melee class, I think it's pretty funny to stack him up with heavy armor, uh, so that he's essentially less of a target for the AI to, uh, to go and try and pick out, and then give him a spell range boosting cudgel, which he's never really going to realistically do any damage with, but effectively this guy just sits on the outskirts of a fight, just picks a nice little hidey hole, and then whenever something needs to be finished off, or whenever there's something that's got a big scary move coming up, he just, he's just there to snipe it with his mace. Uh, just essentially take away MP before a big move, and take away some health to go kill something. Um, 
It sounds very lame, but you know what? All things considered, I'm just really glad that something this dumb still works. I mean, you can pretty much make any old thing work with enough, uh, you know, tweaking and min-maxing, but most stuff will work right out of the gate. Um, so, for example, something like right here, you might think a, uh, a cleric uh, running nothing but this fan would be particularly useful, but the, essentially the fan is classed as a hammer. The hammer gives her access to all these different moves. So if, for example, I were to go and uh, change her into a fire element, which I realistically should, I really don't know why I haven't done that yet. Like, the, the healing is a set amount, but the, uh, the Crimson Reach over here is something that she uses fairly often. Um, so I would go and I would change her into her fire element there, which would mean that she would do more with that move. You get these charms regularly enough that you can switch them out pretty regularly. Um, but, you know, the Caldea also comes with a parry. So this basically means that she has a chance to dodge any physical attacks that come her way, again, unless it's a gun. Um, so, essentially, if there's arrows or there's swords or whatever else coming towards this cleric, she can just quickly slap it out of the way, but her healing is extra range because of this stick. Um, so anyway, you can do all kinds of uh, fun little combinations with that. Um, like, for example, I found it really fun to, uh, to find a uh, higher dexterity uh, uh, berserker here and just uh, kind of uh, do the whole shield and dagger thing with them. Um, I didn't end up uh, using them for the majority of the game because, quite frankly, there were just too many builds to potentially screw around with. Um, like, I just kept going and going and going and the rabbit hole kept going deeper. But, for example, like, let's go for something like this. Like, she's got a parry chance off the dagger. She's got a shield that will give her a higher defensive threshold. You know, we probably would deck her out in something like Wormscale or whatever, but we just go for some heavier armor. Uh, just anything to stack vitality and strength in her favor. Um, so that'll do just fine right there. Like, for example, uh, keeping something like the basic Bronze Helm is worth it just due to stuff like this. Like, 1% damage reduction for everything across the board doesn't sound like much, but bear in mind that the numbers are way higher. So, for example, if she's hit for 300, that's 3 less damage, which, again, doesn't sound like much, but it has saved her before. Um, anyway, so, for example, something like this, yeah, we would just keep stacking them for any vitality or strength bonuses that we could get. So it seems like Damascus would probably be the ideal thing for her down the road, but we'll get there when we get there. We don't have any extra stuff to continue decking her out like this. But this essentially can combine in with her Berserk uh, to allow her dagger to potentially, like, mass, uh, you know, mass uh, stun a bunch of units while being fairly lightweight. Uh, whereas, for example, the uh, the heavy two-hander over there uh, weighed nine. This thing only weighs four. Um, so, you know, the shield also doesn't really weigh very much. So, potentially something like that. Uh, or, for example, you wanted to have a, uh, like, a silence effect on there. Uh, the, uh, oh, which one of these had the uh, the silence? I might have actually, s oh, there we go. The, uh, the Dirk plus one has a silence on there. It weighs only two. So, if you wanted to have an anti-mage uh, anti uh, berserker there, you know, potentially an option as well. The mages do like to hang out in, uh, in squads clumped up in the back of the team. So, potentially, just something to consider. Um, you can pretty much combine anything. Any skill, any uh, any spells, items, whatever else, all of these different slots are made identical looking for a reason. These are all just another little piece to your machine. It's a, your whole team working together to go accomplish whatever your goal happens to be. And really, just making this machine out of all of these various different parts is the fun of the game. So, so again, if we go back to this uh, class change thing over here, like your basic units, like, the warrior is basically your arm specialist. They can use the, the widest variety of weapons. They can guarantee that they're going to hit, and they're going to hit with their secondaries. If, for example, they've got something like an instill, and they've picked up some critical cards, then it's completely worth it for them to, for example, um, go and, uh, you know, stack up something like Double Strike. Because you may notice, Tremendous already doubles damage, so why would you need to attack twice instead? Well, if each of your on-hit effects has additional effects on top of it, that might potentially be useful. Or, for example, like, let's say you want to... Uh, uh, let's say you want to do the same thing at range. Again, Tremendous, by itself, is uh, is all well and good. It doubles damage, knocks the unit back, but instead you go for a double, you get an instill, you get all those crits, um, and potentially maybe you've gotten some other buff effects on there as well, and, you know, double firing might be more useful. Whereas, for example, there's a lot of spellcasters. Most of them have access to similar spell lists, but, for example, something like the Enchantress or Wizard would be your faster uh, caster variant as time went on, they have the ability to uh, to save time when they're casting spells, whereas something like the uh, the Valkyrie would be able to be both melee and would have the ability to save MP when using all those things. 
whereas there's more of a uh, uh, more of a focus on using and capturing and empowering golems through something like the uh, the witch or uh, warlock over here uh, whereas the necromancer would do the same thing for the undead um, so again all of these are just different uh, kind of mishmashes of different potential options so you really just are going more for kind of what they can do rather than their stats the stats are all well and good they'll help them do their job better but just so you know you really want to focus more on kind of making everybody uh, work together in a way that makes sense to you pretty much any build you can think of you can make um and honestly that's like tinkering with this stuff and making dumb stuff work is absolutely possible do you want to never bother with pincers sure that's perfectly fine do you want to stack up three spear units to have uh, triple pincers anytime you want sure who's gonna judge you <laughs> like all of this stuff is just fun like th there's a few hard counters sure like for example if you wanted to make a complete hard counter like anti-dragon type situation you might go for something like over here where they've got dragon's wound dragons have an ability to reflect damage so this will get rid of that and then you combine something like a dragon slayer which will uh, essentially allow them to do dramatically more damage on their own um but then you get something like Dragon's Bane as well, uh, wherein, uh, for example, if a uh, uh, if a uh, if a dragon were to be in front of your team, your entire team would be able to hit it a little bit harder. So basically, you'd be able to stack these two on top of another, and suddenly that dragon does not exist anymore. Is that very oddly spe uh, specific? Yes, but that's again what the scout feature is for. You just go in there, and it's like, oh, great, I'm going to be dealing with that kind of unit. Let's quickly slap together a unit, and there we go, done deal. Anyway, so hopefully this was at least somewhat of a uh, useful uh, rambly bit of nonsense. I'll get into more specific stuff as time goes on, but, uh, you know, let me know what you think. Let me know what you'd like to see, and you'll have a good one. Take care.